In our throwaway world, a plastic bag outlives its usefulness after around 15 minutes. A plastic bottle might last a little longer. Party balloons, a whole occasion. But the ocean likes to hang on to these discarded treasures for decades, even centuries, giving many other consumers a taste for plastic. Just open it up and have a quick look. I mean, I this is a dead flesh-footed shearwater. Funky. What you're about to see may make you feel sick to the stomach. But if you care about your own health and you like the odd bit of seafood, this is essential viewing. Oh, are you all kidding? I am not. 175 pieces of plastic, including bottle tops, balloon ties, and a doll's arm. These are all of the pieces of plastic taken from that bird's stomach three days ago. It represents about 5 to 8% of the bird's body weight. That's the equivalent of me carrying around 3 to 5 kilograms of plastic in my stomach. What makes this even more disturbing is where it's occurring. The beautiful and seemingly pristine Lord Howe Island. Sadly, deaths like these are nothing new to local biologist Ian Hutton. Going on. So you have been documenting this for quite a while. Yeah, back about the year 2000, I started to notice there's little bits of plastic on the forest floor here and began searching and I started to find skeletons of birds. Chick, look, here's one over here in the forest. So this is the sort of thing that we do find here oh, my in, goodness. in May and June after the uh, chicks have either fledged or perished like this one. So that's a chick, we can see the down on it, so it is a chick. And so these are all of the bits of plastic that it's swallowed? That's right. Is this something that you find often? While walking through the forest, I find carcass after carcass just like this. These plastic delicacies are fed to shearwater chicks by their parents, who mistake floating rubbish for fish. We have this year flushed the stomachs of about 50 chicks, and each one of those did have some plastic, some large amounts. Many chicks don't make it to adulthood. It's hardly a surprise that the local shearwaters are in rapid population decline. But this is not a story about a bird species in trouble, nor is it the story of some littering Lord Howe locals. What we're seeing here is a world problem so severe it's hard to fathom. Our fishing nets are no longer made from hemp and from natural fibres. I mean, we drive in plastic, we talk on plastic, we sit on plastic chairs, we, we package our food in it. You can you go on an airplane now and there might be 15 or 20 pieces of plastic just to get you from point A to point B. It's estimated 3.5 million pieces of new plastic into the world's oceans daily. Carried on global currents, they accumulate in huge circulating gyres, causing countless injuries to marine life along the way. That's a global issue. We're finding plastics in seabirds uh, all around Australia. It's happening on our own shores and with our own breeding populations around here as well. Where is it coming from? What's the overall impact on wildlife? Where is it going to? Understanding the sources and sinks of that marine debris is a really big question still. Denise is spearheading a nationwide study to tackle these questions. It's the first time marine debris has been assessed on such a huge scale. Yep, that's perfect. So we're going to just walk up either side of the transect. We're going to look out either side about a metre from okay. us, OK? And on this deserted out. island so beach, plastic can, can be found within seconds. There's a bit. There's a big bit. There's a big bit here. So I'm going to pick that piece up and I'm going to actually look at it on my size chart and I'm going to record how big that piece is what there. Is that? Uh, that actually looks to me like the top of a, of a big jerry can. Just big enough to fit around a bird's neck. Uh, that certainly could. The debris we're finding here is well-travelled, sometimes covered in foreign species. Stowaways like these tiny barnacles may survive for thousands of kilometres and cause devastation to native species when they arrive. So as we go out on these beaches and we pick up rubbish on our shores, we say, okay, this is the debris that's come here. We can then use oceanographic models that tell us, you know, what are the winds, what are the currents? These bits of garbage that ended up here, where did they most likely come from? 
There's 35,000 kilometres of Australian coastline to cover. To fill in information gaps, CSIRO is joining forces with Earthwatch and training up volunteers. We're working with school groups, teachers, citizen scientists around the country because we simply can't get all the information at every little beach along the way. I really think that by teaching kids, that's where we're going to start to see that change. So far, the survey is more than three quarters of the way around the continent. Lord Howe Island is just one stop on the map. It's an important survey point due to its location and its numerous species of nesting seabirds. This one's the Providence Petrel. He's very friendly. Over 270 species worldwide are known to be affected by marine debris including nearly half of all seabird species. Our ultimate goal is to get a priority list to understand which of the species are more and less threatened by marine debris. And to do that, we need to know, you know where those birds are foraging, for example, where those turtles are foraging, or how they feed, or the size of the birds, and those sorts of things. Like many people, I've been aware for some time that plastic is not great for marine life. But it wasn't until I looked closely at the tideline of Ned's beach that the penny really dropped. There's lots of little tiny bits. This is getting into what they, what they call microplastics, right? And if you look here, I bet we've got 50 or 100 bits just in this little bit, so you can see where the water line would have come up. Here's a little bit. Plastics don't biodegrade, but over many years in the sun and elements, they break down into smaller and smaller pieces until they're so small, they're hard to see. Look on any beach in the tide line and you're likely to find hundreds of these tiny little pieces of plastic. It starts to give you an inkling of just how much must be out there. But the real problem with these harmless looking pieces is they can be ingested by animals right down at the bottom of the food chain, as far down as plankton. And that's where plastics come back to meet their maker. Zoologist Dr Jennifer Lavers has spent the past five seasons working on the Lord Howe shearwater problem and has found the severe effects of microplastics are happening at a molecular level. They have what I call the invisible toxic effect. It's, it's less easy to detect but equally as scary. The plastic itself inherently contains a wide array of chemicals that are used during the manufacturing process. When the plastic is put out into the marine environment and it floats around in the ocean for, let's say, 10 or 40 years, it really does last forever, it basically acts like a little magnet or a sponge and it takes all the contaminants that are out there in the ocean environment that are really diluted in the ocean water and it concentrates it onto the surface. Plastic itself has up to a thousand times a higher concentration of contaminants on its surface than the surrounding seawater from which it came. And when the animal, whether it's a turtle or a seabird, takes that into their body, those contaminants leach out into the bloodstream and is incorporated into the tissues. Jennifer collects and weighs plastic from dead birds and sends the feathers off for lab analysis. They reveal what contaminants are in the body. The flesh footed shear order on Lord Howe Island is officially the world's most heavily contaminated seabird. Just from mercury alone, so the toxic threshold that's um, widely regarded around the world for birds is 4.3 parts per million. Anything above that 4.3 ppm is considered toxic to the birds. Well, flesh footed shear waters on Lord Howe Island are between 1,000 and 3,000 parts per million. Aside from death, Mercury can cause a wide array of effects from neurological damage to infertility. And mercury is just one of the many toxic contaminants found in and on plastic debris. There's now a huge range of studies that are coming out almost every month that are showing marine species at the absolute base of the food chain are ingesting these plastics and these contaminants. Anything really that comes out of the ocean, you cannot certify that as organic any longer. It's estimated fish in the North Pacific now consume up to 24,000 tonnes of plastic a year. As one predator eats another, contaminants biomagnify. This means the most vulnerable animal to the effects of toxic plastic contamination is the one at the very top of the food chain, us.
If you eat seafood in any fashion whatsoever, the plastic pollution and corresponding contaminant problem has relevance to you. Results from the marine debris study are yet to be analysed, but major sources of debris are apparent. We do know from the rubbish that we find in the modelling that we're doing that our major population centres, that rubbish on those beaches is local. We're also seeing that, say, areas like Perth and WA, that a lot of our rubbish is actually blowing offshore, which means that we may be delivering that to other places much further afield. If I can say, hey, we know that where we've got those covers over the river mouse like we do in some of the major cities, we know that that really helps stop the rubbish from getting out there, then we can start to make management decisions at really relevant scales. So does anybody get a gold star? Is anyone doing it right? Observationally, we do not find full plastic bottles or cans or glass bottles in, in South Australia, and I would likely attribute that to the, to the container deposit scheme that they have there. The waste that's associated with the beverage industry comprises about a third, and some estimates are as high as a half of the marine debris that we find globally. So that's bottles and cans and straws and disposable coffee cups. Bring your to-go cup with you. A lot of the solutions to the plastic problem are really simple and we can, each and every one person can make a change in this. It's not just governments that need to come in and enact sweeping changes. With each one of us contributing around 67 kilograms of plastic waste a year, avoiding single-use plastics can make an enormous difference to the environment and ultimately our own well-being. Whether or not you interact with the ocean on a daily basis or you've been fortunate enough to see an albatross come into your life, you really need to kind of think twice about where your food is coming from and what role you and your surrounding community have played in the plastic pollution contaminant problem. Thank <laughs> you.